We're going to look for reliable indicators of deception, and these will be divided into three different areas. The patterns of behaviors, the cognitive approach, and behavioral synchrony and rapport. First, let's start with the patterns. In previous modules, we've talked about nonverbal and verbal cues that have been known to be reliable indicators of deception. The problem with looking for individual cues is that they're faint and they might look different from person to person. Some of them might be easy to mask, and some of them are only reliable in certain contexts. Therefore, rather than looking for a Pinocchio's nose, I'm going to suggest that instead we look for patterns of cues. These include tension, signs of cognitive load, and uncertainty. First of all, liars are more tense than truth tellers. Truth tellers believe in a fair and just world. They believe in the face value of their innocence, and they don't need to justify themselves or prove their innocence. Deceivers, on the other hand, know they don't have credibility, and this means that they have to prove themselves. This leads them to be more tense. It shows up in certain cues like higher pitch, pupil dilation, signs of nervousness, vocal tension, lip pressing, and facial unpleasantness. The second cue is that lying is more cognitively complex than telling the truth. Creating is more cognitively difficult than remembering. Truth tellers just have to remember what happened and recount that story. It's fairly simple. But liars have to invent a story, tell that story in a credible way, monitor their audience for signs of suspicion, try not to con contradict anything they've already said, remember what story they've already told to other people. There's a lot going on. This means that they show signs of their cognitive load in their verbal statements. They have longer pauses. They wait longer to answer. They use fewer illustrator gestures, fewer hand and finger movements or leg and foot movements. They repeat themselves more. They tell the same story over and over, and they don't really add new details for fear that they might contradict themselves. The third cue is that liars endorse their lies less than truth tellers, what has been called a lack of embracement. This means that they're more ambivalent, less involved, and more uncertain when they tell their story. These patterns might look a little different from person to person. I might show tension in my face by biting my lip or furrowing my brow. You might show tension by chewing your fingernails. But if we know what tension could look like and we see evidence of it, that might be a clue that we're on the right track. Remember though that lots of people can look tense for other reasons, so it's still not a Pinocchio's nose, but it's a step in the right direction. Now let's talk about the cognitive approach to deception detection. The patterns are a good start, but there's other ways to detect deception too. Let's shift our attention away from what the deceiver is doing and toward what the questioner can do to elicit more of these cues. Professor Vry says there's a few techniques we can use to increase the cognitive load for deceivers and make them more evident. We can start by asking unexpected questions. The ability to plan is an important factor. Telling the lie with no planning is more difficult than if you have time to plan out your lie. Second, we can ask the liar to tell the story in reverse order. This might sound strange, but I could say, tell me everything you did today, starting from when you arrived here and working backwards to when you got up. Forward order is more natural, so a backward order requires more cognitive resources and puts the liar under pressure. We could ask the same question twice. If you ask a question at the start and at the end of the interview, you can really test the liar's memory. They could contradict themselves and show their lie. We can also ask the liar to draw out their answer. Vry and colleagues have asked people to draw the spatial layout of a space, such as a crime scene, and they saw differences in the detail in the sketches provided by liars and truth tellers. We can also ask a liar to play devil's advocate. In the case of a liar, the devil's advocate opinion is their real opinion, so it will be the one that's more detailed. We can also use evidence to see how much a liar knows. Ask the liar to explain the existence of evidence, and you'll likely get denials or changes in their story. In general, taking the liar's ability to plan and keeping their story straight will not only point you towards contradictions which help show their lies, but also make the signs of tension, cognitive load, and uncertainty we talked about earlier more evident. The third approach is one that relates to interpersonal synchrony. This is one avenue of research I've been pursuing to look for signs of rapport or synchrony as a method of detecting deception. Synchrony refers to the similarity and rhythmic qualities and the enmeshing or coordination of behavioral patterns of both parties in an interaction.
we're naturally inclined towards synchrony or mutual adaptation because meshing with movements, tempo, and linguistic patterns of partners is both a polite and a natural form of behavior. If we're naturally inclined towards synchrony, there might be little difference between truth tellers and deceivers initially because deceivers will be trying to approximate the normal conversational pattern of truth tellers. But we think synchrony is a good way to detect deception for two reasons. First, establishing rapport and trust with someone is a good way to encourage an accurate confession. In our study, we found that interviewers who maintained the most behavioral synchrony in face-to-face -face interactions elicited the most confessions. Christian Meisner and his colleagues have been promoting what they call a positive collaborative approach to interviews and interrogations as an alternative to the psychologically manipulative interrogation techniques that have traditionally been used but have the potential to elicit false confessions. Establishing rapport and creating a safe environment for someone to tell you what they know makes it more likely that people will be truthful. Second, synchrony is a tool that deceivers can use to put the interviewer at ease. While it might be tempting to assume that a lack of synchrony is a sign of deceit, our preliminary results suggest the opposite. Synchrony breaks down when a truth teller gets falsely accused, and our results show that the opposite is true for skilled liars who are lying without prompting from the experimenter. They work hard to maintain what looks normal, and so while they've had a breakdown in synchrony as well, it was not as extreme as the breakdown that happened for truth tellers. In other words, skilled liars use behavioral synchrony with the interviewer to make themselves look more honest. We've discussed three ways to make lie detection more accurate. First, rather than looking for individual verbal and nonverbal cues, instead focus on overall patterns of communication, such as tension, cognitive load, or uncertainty. Second, make it more difficult for liars to lie. Increase the cognitive difficulty of the task in order to make the signs of deception more evident. Third, use rapport and synchrony, both to create an atmosphere of trust to make a person feel they can be more honest and also look for whether the liar is using synchrony to appear honest under pressure. I hope you'll find these tips more helpful than looking for Pinocchio's nose.